Hi, welcome to another episode of Teradata Tech Bytes. My name is Mohammad Zubair Iqbal and I am an associate data scientist at Teradata GTC Pakistan. This is the third part of a five part series on time series analysis using unbounded array framework functions of Teradata 17.20 under the name of Clearscape Analytics. In this episode, I'll show you how functions like general utility, data preparation, descriptive statistical, diagnostic statistical, model preparation, and series forecasting functions in UAF accelerates the data exploration, cleaning, and discovery when called from Python using Teradata's package Teradata ML and how UAF functions are empowering us to solve time series problems in this demo, I will be using the UAF functions to solve the time series forecasting problem of cash demand. So our demo today is going to be done through a Jupyter notebook using Python and our Python package for Vantage Teradata ML to show you how to call Vantage UAF functions. This demo explains the cash demand forecasting using Clearscape analytics. Now jumping to the problem outline. Predicting future demand for cash in automatic teller machines known as the ATMs is crucial for any bank as ATMs are still largely used to dispense cash to customers. ATM cash replenishment is the process of refilling an ATM with specific amount of cash. Due to vacillating users' demands and seasonal patterns, it is a very challenging problem for financial institutions to keep the optimal amount of cash for each ATM. Solution. In this demo, we present a time series model of Teradata Auto Regressive Integrated Moving Average, popularly known as ARIMA, to solve this problem. We performed different exploratory analysis tests, visualizations, diagnostic statistics, and more, all using the in database capability of Teradata. We forecasted the amount of required future cash in an ATM by developing a time series modeling pipeline on cash demand data. The demo shows the power of Vantage through its in-database analytics time series capabilities which provide a comprehensive suite of functions used by data scientists across the industry including but not limited to data preparation, data exploration, elimination of non-stationarity, formulation of candidate model, goodness of fit model validation and model forecasting. An important aspect that we need to understand before diving straight into the UAF framework is the type of inputs it takes. Now, jumping to the UAF framework section. So the UAF supports one dimensional and two dimensional spatiotemporal analysis. You can also pass a generated series to UAF rather than using a pre-existing series instance. And most commonly used inputs in this demo would be analytical result tables, which easily allow us to retrieve the result data and pass it to other UAF functions. These art tables are generated using into art or into volatile art clause of the UAF function. The into art will create a permanent table while the into volatile will create a volatile table or a temporary table. Now, some insight of the data itself. As stated before, it's a cash demand forecasting demo data and it's an anonymized data set from a bank in the UK. The data is composed of daily cash demands for an ATM. Now, we have divided the notebook into different sections, including the database connection, data cleaning, data exploration, diagnostic statistics, building the model, validation of the model, exponential smoothing, and forecasting the future values. So the first one in line is the DB Connect. Now, I'm not going to go through every one of these imports but it is wise to say that because we have built Teradata ML on top of combination of Pandas and SQL Alchemy, we need to do those imports. And I've used matplotlib and image from PIL to do some plotting. 
and loading graphs images from Teradata Vantage into the notebook. Now let's go down where we are building the connection. So the first thing we need to do is create a connection context. Please keep in mind before running this cell, you must have a valid user ID and password to build the connection as the prompt will appear asking you for your user ID and password. And that context is the combination of the system with a specified user that has all the login mechanisms you are using. I am using LTAP here, which is going to establish that connection so that I can create data frames. Now, here we are just running a statement in the Jupyter Notebook to load the SQL statements in the Jupyter Notebook. And in this cell, we are creating a connection with the database name we specified in the cell number two. Now, just for our validation, we are selecting the top five rows from our data set and we are ordering it by date. Real world data has noise in it. To process, learn and make predictions out of this data, we need to clean it. For this purpose, let's jump to our data cleaning section of our notebook. The first function we use for data cleaning purposes was Teradata get rows with missing data. This function is used to display the null values in the specified input table. The function would help us identify if there is a pattern or if any timestamp is missing in the data. After this, we can plan accordingly on how to deal with these missing values. We applied this function to our NN5 data table, the specified target column as a parameter, and the output of this table consists of entries with null values for a specified column. Here, you can see that we have identified NN5 underscore 3 as our target column, and this is the input to the function, and below is the output of these. Here we are printing the number of missing values in our target label, which comes out to be 18. Next thing we are doing is the box plot for outlier detection. A box plot is a standardized way of displaying the distribution of data based on five number summary, which I'll be discussing later. We are creating an uh, N5 underscore three data table this table is created with our target label and the timestamp for each data point. Here we have added an additional column known as the ID call to give our time series a unique ID. Also, it will be useful later in plotting the graph. Here we are converting the table to pandas data frame, printing some values from the head and checking if there are any null values present in the data and replacing those values with zero if there are. Now, here we are building a box plot for outlier detection. The box plot is divided into four equal sized groups. The box itself represents the range in which 50% of the data lies. And in our case, 50% of the data is within the range of 13 to 28. The lower end of the plot is the first quartile, which is 25% of the data, and that is below Q1. Now for our use case, 25% of the data is below 30. The upper end is the third quartile, and this represents that 25% of the data is above Q3, which means in our case, 25% of the data is greater than 28 transactions. Between Q1 and Q3 is the interquartile, and a median is a straight line of two equal groups. Now, there is a concept of whiskers, that how we will identify the outliers. Now, in the graph, you can see that there are black circles which are well above this horizontal line. Now, if any value is 1.5 times the interquartile range or the average of values from your upper or lower quartile, then those values will be marked as an outlier. So this is how we are identifying the outliers in our dataset. 
Next thing is the outlier detection using the outlier filter fit. So we saw a significant number of outliers in the box plot and we need a function to filter out these outliers. So we have the TD outlier filter fit and TD outlier filter fit transform function. The TD outlier filter fit function calculates the lower percentile, upper percentile, count of rows, median for a specified input column. The calculated values for each column help the TD outlier filter transform function to detect the outliers in the input table. The outlier method can be chosen based on our requirement, which can be either percentile, tucky, or carling. We choose percentile to get the statistics described before on our dataset. The output of this function will be used as the input for the outlier transform function where the actual transformation will happen on our target column. Now, here you can see that the, we are deleting the values which are the outliers and we have used the method of percentile. This is the output of outlier fit, which will be the input of outlier filter transform. So basically we have identified the thresholds for the outliers in the outlier filter fit, and we want to pass it to the filter transform function to actually do the transformations. Now here you can see that the TD outlier filter transform function is the input to this TD outlier filter transform. Now, here you can see that we are printing out the values where the where the values are null in our dataset and it is zero. And the total number of values are 645. Now, the next thing we have is the TD resample function. Once the outliers are removed, we are left with irregular series, which means that there might be some instances where timestamps can go missing. So we have to use the TD resample function. But before that, we have to find the minimum date to start with. Here we have written the SQL for finding the minimum date from our TD outlier filter transform table. And it turned out to be this date. Just to reiterate the point, we have removed the outliers from the data. So we have to run the TD resample function, which will transform the irregular time series into regular time series. And we have to perform the interpolation on the data. The input to this function is a logical series containing any form of regular or irregular series of real numbers. The series can be time series, a special series or an arbitrary numerical series. We can choose from various interpolation strategies to deal with missing data, including the linear, lag, lead, weighted, and spline. The output of this function returns a table with a select statement, and the result can be either univariant or multivariant. Now, for our use case, we have applied this function, TD resample. The table name has to be the outlier filter transform, and the row axis has to be a time code or a sequence. For our case, it was the time code and that was in the date time column. column. For the series ID, it has to be a unique identifier for every series in your data table. For the payload, we have fields parameter, which contains the target column, which in our case is NN53 and the content parameter which identifies the type of content present in the fields. Then we have a start value which we found out just earlier. Then we have a duration which specifies the days which in our case is one as the data is daily data and interpolation type. For our use case linear interpolation would work so we have used the linear interpolation. Next, we are just selecting the top 15 rows from the data resampled dataset. And this is the result of the resampled function. 
and we are ordering it by row i which is the timestamp. So the next thing we have is the data exploration section. Now data exploration is done to learn more about the data. For example, the trends, the dependence, statistics of the column or data and other such kind of statistics. Now let's jump to the data exploration section of our notebook. The first function we have in line is the TD univariant statistics. Univariant statistics displays the descriptive statistics for each specified numeric input table column. The input to this function requires the target column name, name and the statistics we want to print. The output of this table consists of statistics, name and the value of each statistic. For our use case, we have identified the target column as NN5 and the statistics we want to perform is the mean, trimmed mean, median, mode, screeness, standard error, standard deviation, and more. Now here in the output, we have the attribute name, the statistics name, and the statistic value. Okay. So the next function we used for the data exploration is the TD input validator. This function validates the data and identifies the series and matrices that have indiscrete data. The input to this function uses a collection of either logical series or logical matrices. These logical types can be regular or irregular and their indices can be based on time or space. Now, this is the function TD input validator. In the series spec, we have identified the table name. The row axis is the time code, which is row i. The series ID, which is again a unique identifier, and in our case, it is ID column. The payload consists of the target column, the content of the field, and in the function parameter, we have added a failure mode. Now, the failure mode indicates how many rows to display when the input instance is indiscrete. Options are function first and function all. The function first lists the first row that makes the instance indiscrete and function all lists all the indiscrete rows. We have used the function all as a parameter. Now you can see that there are no outliers present in our dataset. Now again, we are building the box plot for the outlier detection. We are converting the table into the pandas data frame. We are printing the head out, the null values. If, the pre if there are, we are using uh, the dot values dot any and is null function. Now, if you see that in the box plot, there are no outliers present in our data. So we have dealt with the outliers using the TD resample, TD outlier fit and TD outlier filter transform function. So the next thing we have is the capability of TD plot. Now, TD plot provides us the ability to generate the charts. The generated charts can be in JPEG, PNG or SVG formats. The following chart styles are available, line, scatter, bar, mesh, seismic and geometry. For this demo purposes, we use only the line, scatter and bar plot. Now, the TD plot function takes a logical series, matrices or art as input. These series may have real numbers or multivariate reals, vectors or real numbers as their individual elements. These logical series can be regular or irregular. They, their indexing can be based on integer or float data types. The output is an image in the format specified in the function com command. Now, the important thing to notice here is all the processing is done within in database. The output is saved in the form of JPEG, PNG or SVG as per your requirement. And just for displaying purposes, we move the image or the table to the pandas data frame and visualize the result. Also, it was tested on a record of 22 million rows that TD outperformed Tableau and Matplotlib. With TD, it took around 14 seconds to build a plot, while in other frameworks like Tableau, 
it took around 7 minutes and 47 seconds and for matplotlib it took around 9 minutes and 7 seconds. So in terms of speed and performance, Teradata stands out. Now let's jump to the plots. The first one we have is the line plot. We plotted the line chart to understand the trend between the time series and the daily cash demand. The other reason is that we can see the general trend of the daily cash demands over a certain time. Now on the x-axis you'll find the time series and on the y-axis you'll find the target column that is the NN53. Now talking about the inputs, we first specify the table name which is the resampled dataset. Then we specify the row axis, which is time code and the column name, which is row i, which is nothing but the time series column. Then we have a series ID, which is a unique identifier for only one series. So if we have multiple ID columns or IDs in the table, then it would be identified as two different series if there are two IDs. Now for the payload, we have the field and content parameter. Now, in the parameter, we have to pass the target var variable and in the content, we have to pass that what is what is the type of the uh, field we mentioned. Now, on the function parameter, we have to set the layout of the plot, which is one cross one because we are only making, making one plot. The title of the plot, the ID, the cell, which is first column and first row, the title of the plot, the, if we are using any markers, the legend, X label, Y label, etc. It's, it's just about the customization of the plot. Now, these results are stored in the table, which we have made of under the name of line graph. And that table is then passed to Pandas data frame. And for visualization purposes, we use image.open. And we passed in the image. And you can see that there is the results with, where on X axis, we can see the time series and on the Y axis, we can see the cash demands. Now we have the scatter graph. For the scatter plot, we define the type as scatter. It would be good to know if we have a relation between the time series and the targeted column that is NN53. We will know through this plot that which months or month is or are the busy months meaning the more clustered the data points are in a certain month or month, we can say for sure that the cash flow increases in that or those months. On the x-axis, we have the time series and on the y-axis, we have the targeted column. Now, the pattern is followed the same as we were using for the line plot. The only difference is that in the type parameter, we have to pass in scatter. Other customizations you can do as per your requirement. Again, we are creating a table and then passing that table to Pandas data frame. And these are the results. Now on the X axis, you can see the time series and on the Y axis, you can see the cash demands. Now, the, the there might be some clusters if you have any multiple series of different colors. So you can identify that which years or in which years the cash demands increase or in which year the cash demands decrease. Now here we can conclude that in the, in the 1996 to 1996, seven and 1996, 10, which is the month, there was some, there was a low cash demand here between these, these months. But then if we look at this between the months of 10 and 1998 first, we can see that there was an increase in the cash demand. So this valuable insight you can get from the scatter plot. The next thing we have is the bar plot. Now for bar plot, we have to define the type as bar. It is useful if we have this type of visualization in which we can see the cash flow within months over a period. We can identify the month in which the cash flow increased, which months are prominent for the highest and the lowest cash flows by analyzing the data from the past few years. Now before that, we have to create a table. Now creating a table that will have the monthly sum of cash flows over months for a year. We do this by extracting the month and the year from the date column, applying the sum on the cash flows, which is the NN53 in our case, and then grouping them on the basis of the months and years 
this would give us the sum of monthly cash flows for years now this is how it's done we have extracted the month from row i the year from row i and then we are just adding them together the, the cash flows as nn53 from the resample data set and then grouping them by month and year and here you can see in the output that here is the year here is the month and this is the sum of cash flows within this certain month of a certain year now here we are applying the td plot and building an r table for the results here we are using the month as a sequence because it's not a time code as row x's series id would be year and on the payload we are passing nn53 and we are doing this for a specific year which is 1996 and all the other parameters in but this type which has to be bar in the bar plot case are the same again we are creating a table out of it and then this is the result of the past table now you can see that on the y-axis we have the cash flows and on the x-axis we have the months and the legend explains that this is for the year 1996 then we have the seasonal plots the seasonal plot of a month over a year is actually a line graph it is plotted to visualize the trend of cash flow over a month and I uniquely identified the trend for each year it is built to see if the trend repeats each year or not the syntax is the same and we are passing the month year and field content is real the layout and and we have some customizations for the height and width now we are building this seasonal plot for year 1996 1997 and 1998 now in this table we have years 1996 1997 and 1998 now you can see that each year is represented by a different color code now this graph shows the trend of cash flows for certain years so the next thing we have in the table of contents is the TD power spectrum. Now the TD power spectrum function converts a series from a time or spatial domain to a frequency domain in order to facilitate the frequency domain analysis. Its calculations serve to estimate the correct power spectrum associated with the time series. Now the data scientists can use either power spectrum or line spectrum to determine whether there exist any periodicities in their data set. The power spectrum helps us to visualize the data in the frequency domain. We can identify different patterns in the series and all this processing is done in database. So Teradata is maintaining the processing time to a minimum. Now, if we talk about the function parameters, we have the series spec, which consists of table name, which has the resample data set as the table the series ID, which is ID call, the row axis, which is time code, but a sequence can be given, a payload, which has our target column and its content. Now, the function parameter has a frequency style. Now, you can explore between different frequency styles, ranging from the K integral, K sample rate, K radians, K hertz, and K periodicity. For our use case, K radians was enough. Now printing out the table values. Now we have in the output table the spectral density for the targeted column, the row i and the id column. Okay. So then we have the TD ACF, also known as autocorrelation function. The TD ACF calculates the autocorrelation or autocovariance of the time series. Autocorrelation or autocovariance shows how the time series correlates or covaries with itself when delayed by a lag in time or space. When TD ACF is computed, a coefficient corresponding to a particular lag is affected by all the previous lags. For example, the coefficient for a lag 4 includes the effects of activity at lags 3, 2, and 1. Also in the graph, we can see that slowly decaying or oscillatory lag coefficient patterns are a sign of non-stationarity. In our use case, this type of exploratory analysis 
is useful for identifying how many previous values are impacting the current value in the data of the cache flows. Now, we have the function tdacf which takes the series spec. We, we pass the table name resample dataset, the series ID which is ID calls, row access and payload. These are all the same parameters which we are using. Now, for the function parameters, we can see that there are a lot of parameters. Now, I'll go through one by one. For the max lag, it's the maximum number of lags to calculate the autocorrelation or autocovariance. For the function type, it's zero for autocorrelation and one for autocovariance. For the QSTAT, it is an indicator to provide the adjunct box Q statistics and its associated p-value for each autocorrelation coefficient. Use 0 for no and 1 for yes. Then we have the d-mean, which is an indicator to subtract the mean x from each element of x in the formula before for calculating the autocorrelation or autocovariance. We use 0 for no and 1 for yes. Then we have the value of alpha, which is the level to return the confidence interval. Now, if we print out the resultant table, we have the ID column, the row, axis, and in 5, 3, which is our target column, the QSTAT value, the P value associated with it, and the confidence intervals. Now, if we jump to PACF, which is partial autocorrelation, coefficient function. So TDPACF provides insights as to whether the function being modeled is stationary or not. The partial autocorrelation are used to measure the degree of correlation between time series sample points. The algorithm removes the effects of previous lags. For example, the coefficient for lag 4 focuses on the effect of activity based only at lag 4 with the effects of lag 3 to 1 removed. Also, in the graph, we can see that slowly decaying or oscillatory lag coefficient patterns are a sign of non-stationarity. So when we run such type of data exploration function at scale in Teradata with its in-database capability, it can outperform other open source function due to its speed and performance. Now, if we talk about function parameters, we have the max lags, which is same as for the ACF the unbiased, which is the formula for a denominator to calculate the autocovariance. We use zero for jenkins watt formula and one for box Jenkins formula. Then we have the input type, the algorithm and alpha value, which we can always tweak around as per our requirement. Now for the output, we have the ID column, the row I, the NN53, which is our target column and the confidence intervals. So the next thing we have to do is to build a stationarity panel by using all the computations we are doing like power spectrum, the ACF and the PACF. Now the TD plot is used for building a stationarity panel. The stationarity panel plot provides a visual mechanism that the data scientists can employ to determine whether or not their process is stationary. Here you can see that we have built a stationarity panel on the TD plot function. We have identified the series which we are using, like we are, we are building a plot for the original series. We are building a plot for ACF results, which is autocorrelation function, for the PACF, which is partial autocorrelation function, and the spectral density, which is the result of power spectrum. Now, if we note here, we have changed the layout to two by two and the width, also the height. We have added the title and we have assigned it the IDs and the cell. For the first plot, we have assigned the ID of first column, first row. For the second, we have first column, second row. For the third, we have second column, first row. And for the last, we have second column and second row. And all the other parameters are just for the customization of your plot. We are building a table which will store the result for the image and we are converting that to pandas data frame. Now if you see that there's original series on the first column and first row, 
we have the results from autocorrelation function in the first column of second row. Then we have the results from the partial autocorrelation function, which is the second column of the first row. And we have the results of power spectrum in the second column of second row. Now, this dictionary panel is also important in identifying the P and Q values, which we will be using in building the model. I'll share the image in the building model module and we'll see that how we are using these plots in identifying the P and Q value. Now let's jump to the checking for stationarity section to do some diagnostic statistics. So diagnostic statistics are done by testing the presence of non-stationarity in the data. To make the data model ready, we first test the series and then use the appropriate technique to make it stationary. Now we have identified that to check if the series is non-stationary or stationary, we use the TD Dickey-Fuller test. And to remove that non-stationarity or seasonality from the data, we use TD Diff and TD Seasonal Normalized function respectively. I'll be explaining about these functions when we are on those modules. Now, Without any due, we can jump to the functions. Now, TD Dickey Fuller test. So, TD Dickey Fuller test is a statistical test which is used to test the presence of unit roots. The presence of unit roots mean that the process is non stationary. However, the opposite is not the true, meaning the absence of unit roots does not mean that the process is stationary. Rather, it means that the process may or may not be stationary based on other factors. The stationarity panel plot should be consulted for the final verdict. Now, as stated before, TD Dickey Fuller test checks the presence of one or more unit roots in the series to determine if the series is non stationary. It takes a single logical runtime series as an input, and the output of this function returns a primary result set consisting of one row per unique series acted upon by the function. It has the null hypothesis, which is that the series is non-stationary. Now, in the case that it is accepted, it means it would have a p-value greater than 0.05. And this would mean that the series is non-stationary. While in the reject case, the value of p would be less than 0.05, and this would mean that the series is stationary. Now, if we talk about the function inputs, we have the table, we have the series ID, the row axis, we have the time code and row I column as our input. We have the payload field, content, and in the function parameter, we have algorithm. Now, there are different algorithms available. We can use them in the Dickey Fuller test. So the algorithms may vary from none, which means random walk, drift, random walk with drift. We have trend, random walk with linear trend, and drift and trend, which is random walk with drift and trend. Now let's jump to the output of the Dickey Fuller test. Now, we have the ID column, the row I, the number of samples, the algorithm used, the t stat value, p value, and the null hypothesis. Now, one point to notice here is that we don't only look at the p value for checking the stationarity in the series. We also take into consideration the t stat value and the td plot, which was used to create the stationary panel. So now, as you can see that the p value is less and the null hypothesis is accepted, but there is a t stat value which is negative of 4.9. Now, a less negative value of t stat value means that the model is not confident enough to say if the series is stationary. So this means that the model has a very low confidence in the series that it is stationary. So just to be on a safe side, we used the differenced function to make the series stationary. Now, what TD diff does is it transforms stationary, seasonal, and non-stationary time series into differenced time series. It is basically the difference between the series with itself, for instance, subtracting the value at t with t minus d 
where d can be 1, 2, 3 or any integer number. Now, if we talk about the function parameters, we have series spec with the table name, series id, row access, payload, content, function parameters. And in the function parameters, we have the differences, which is the difference between time series elements yt and yt minus lag. And it can be zero or a positive integer. We have used one as a difference for this, this time series. Now, another one is lag, which is the lag between the series elements. And we have used a lag of one as our data was daily data. So we used a lag of one. And seasonal multiplier is an indicator that the time series is seasonal. A value of zero indicates that the time series is non-seasonal. A positive integer indicates the time series is seasonal. We have used a value of zero, which means that our time series is not seasonal. Here we are just printing out the output of the different series. Now, if we apply again the Dickey Fuller test with the same parameters that we used earlier and get the results of this test, you can see that the T stand value increased from minus four to minus 23, which means that the model is now more confident on the series that the series is stationary. So this can be used as an input to our model training. Now, the next one is the TD seasonal normalize. The TD seasonal normalize takes a non-stationary series and normalizes the series by removing the unit roots. The function can be used with any cyclic data that can be subdivided into a collection of logical periods in which each period can be further subdivided into a collection of logical intervals. Teradata also identifies and removes seasonality through its in-database capability of Clearscape Analytics from a series. And all of this is done in in-database, so we can see a significant difference in terms of time and performance if the volume of the data is huge. Now, coming to the function parameters of seasonal normalize, we have the series spec with the same parameters as we are using. Now, an additional function parameter is interval which in our case is the daily data and we have days and has the value of one. Now in the function parameters, we have the season cycle, which is used. In our case, we have used the cycles as days and duration is set to 14. And this is because we want to know if the cycle repeats itself within two weeks. And in the output FMT, we have index style set to numerical sequence. Here we are printing the output from the seasonal normalized function. Now, the TD seasonal normalized function returns two result sets of the data. The primary result set contains the computed seasonal normalized values. And a secondary art metadata result set contains the mean and standard deviation for each column in the primary art primary layer. Now, if we extract the metadata of the seasonal normalized function, we can see we have the two columns as mean and standard deviation. Now, how to understand this, these results is to know that if the values of the mean are closer to each other, like in this case, 20.9, 21.2, 21.3, this means that the series has a constant mean and the series is non-seasonal and we have slightly varying standard deviation. Now let's jump to our building model section to build a model on our dataset. Now, ARIMA is a statistical model for analyzing and forecasting the time series data. It adds the parts of integration to regression for making the data stationary with the use of differentiation. ARIMA is a notation for P, D, and Q, where the parameters are filled with values to indicate the ARIMA model being used for the purpose of training, testing, and forecasting. ARIMA consists of following parameters P, which is the lag or previous value count to predict the forecast, D, the number of differentiation for making the data stationary, and Q, moving average window size. Now, we have used the TD ARIMA estimate function of the Teradata to train the model on our data with the parameter values defined in the cell. 
As ARIMA is a state-of-the-art machine learning model used for, for forecasting, Teradata provides, provides us the capability to train this model on the time series data. Now, the series spec, which is same the table name, which is the different series we will be using, the series ID, the row axis, the payload, and within the function parameter, we have the model order, which are the values from P, D, and Q. Now, how do we get these values? We have to refer the TD plot for stationarity panel. Now, there's a general rule of thumb, which I'll be talking about in the PACF and ACF. For the P value, we have to refer to the partial autocorrelation function plot. Now, if we have two downstreams, like here you can see the values are decreasing and on the second iteration, it's also decreasing. Then a general rule of thumb is we take a value which is previous, like one downstream here and another downstream here. So we can take a value of one or we can take a value of two. For the value of Q, we have to use the autocorrelation function plot. The rule is the same. Now, if you see that this one is the downstream and there is also another downstream, but the difference is in the second downstream, the value here is within the range, within the optimal region. So there is only one downstream actually. So we used a value of one for Q and you can use the value one or two for the value of P. And for the value of T, you have to refer to the TD diff function. And here you have seen that the difference applied to the series is one. So now jumping back to the ARIMA estimate function, we have a model order of two, one, and one. We have lags, which is one, the constant one, algorithm, MLE, fit percentage is basically a train and test split. It means that 70% of the data is used for training. Fit matrices one, which means we want to print the values of matrices. The coefficient stats, we want to print them, so its value is one, residuals, is one, which means we want to print the difference of actual minus the predicted ones. And max iteration is the number of epochs a model will run. So the output table here contains the estimated coefficients with accompanying per coefficient statistical ratings. The ARIMA estimate generates a secondary art fit metadata result set with goodness of fit metadata, a tertiary art fit residual result set with residuals from the fitting operation, a quaternary art model result set with validation model context, and a quaternary art validate result set with the validation series. All these result sets are retrieved directly from the TD extract function. Now, if we jump to the TD extract function, so the TD extract function retrieves auxiliary result sets stored in an art. The auxiliary layers are as follows. The art fit residuals contains the residual series. Art fit metadata contains the goodness of fit matrices. Art model shows the validation model context and art validate is used for the internal validation process. Now, here we have used the TD art, art fit metadata for extracting the results from the layer of art fit metadata by using the function td extract results. Now, if you see the output of this layer, you'll see that there are different accuracy matrices here in the output table, mean squared error, mean average error, mean error, standard error, etc. And here we have used the td extract result and we have passed the table, which is the table from our model. And in the layer, we have identified the art fit residuals the residuals are nothing but a difference of your calculated value minus the actual one. So if you subtract the calculated from this one, you'll get a residual. Next thing we have to do is plot the actual versus the calculated values. Here we are just printing the residuals. Now, before that, we have to create a table. Now here, what we are doing is we are assigning different series ID to different predictions. And we are assigning a different series ID to the actual value. 
here yes you can see that we have assigned 11 to the actual values and 12 to the calculated values this means that there are two series in the table now printing out the values here we are using the td plot function in the table name we are using the newly created table which has the two series of 11 and 12 we are passing the sequence as row i the series id is id column and we are passing the fit magnitude which is the output of the model now if you see that we have title arima estimate phase actual which is 11 and fitted as an id of 12 now we are formatting some plots the red is for actual and the blue one is for predicted one again creating a table and passing it to pandas data frame now here are our results of training the red line explains the actual value and the blue line represents the predicted value now if we see this plot we can see that there is room for improvement as there are instances where the predicted values are way below or way above the actual values now let's jump to the validation of the model section now the teradata function td arima validate in 17.20 is used to run the trained model on the unseen data that is the validation data to tune some hyperparameters of the model to improve accuracy. The validation of the unseen data is important in the real world to see how the model is performing on the unseen data. Now, if we can recall, we used 70% of the data for training and the remaining 30% was left because we want to use that data in the validation set. So, this would this would take the, that 30% of the data which is remaining for running the statistics. Now, if we jump to the function parameters, it takes the input table from the original TD Arima estimate table and the function parameters are fit matrices and residuals. Fit matrices is an indicator to generate the secondary result set that contains the model metadata statistics. A value of one means generate the secondary result set a value of zero means do not generate the secondary result set. And for the residuals, it's also uh, an indicator to generate the tertiary result set that contains the model residuals. A value of one means generate the tertiary result set. A value of zero means do not generate. And we have passed one to both these function parameters. So here you can see the output of this validation, like mean squared error, the AIC, the MLR, and the number of samples. Now, we have the TD extract results. This time, we ran the TD extract result on the validation set. And all the layers are the same, ranging from art fit residuals, art fit metadata, art model, and art validate. Now, if we jump to this input of the extract results, we can see that it now takes the table from the validation set and the layer is art fit residuals. Now, if we print the layer results, we can see the residuals, which is calculated minus the actual values. And here are the results. Now, this step is similar to the training step which is plotting the actual versus the forecasted values. First, we have to create a table to assign specific or unique IDs to different series. The one is the actual series and the other is the calculated series. We have assigned the ID as 11 for the actual series and 12 for the predicted series. Printing some values. And here we are using the TD plot, which is similar to what we were doing in the training. We are passing the table, the row axis has the row i, the series id, which is id call. Remember, we have assigned the different id columns, ids to two different series. One is 11 and one is 12. Then we have the fit magnitude, which, are, which is the value for the predicted and actual. And below are some customizations to the plot. Now, Again, we are creating a table 
and passing it to pandas just for visualization purposes. Now, here you can see that the red line represents the actual values of the validation dataset and the blue line represents the predicted values. These results are good, but the results can be improved. And that's why we built the final model. Now let's jump to our final model. Now for the final model, we have applied TT smooth MA function, which applies a smoothing function to time series with non stationary means. And eventually we'll create a new time series with stationary mean. Now, if we go to the function parameters, we have the series spec, which contains the table name, the ID column, the time code, and the field. Now notice here, the table name is the resample dataset, which is the original resample dataset. Instead of using a differenced series, we are using the resample dataset here. Now in the function parameters, we have cumulative. Now this can vary from case to case. For our case, it was cumulative, but you can go around with mean, median, or exponential. Now, the after steps are the same as for the baseline model. We use the TD Arima estimate function, but the only difference here is that we use the result of smoothing as the input to the TD Arima estimate rather than the differenced series and all the other parameters, including the series ID, row axis, payload, and function parameters, even the model order is the same. So here we ran the TD Arima estimate function. Then we computed the coefficient value, the standard error, and the zstat values. We used the TD extract result functions and extracted the results from the layer of, of artfit metadata. And here are the accuracy matrices, including the mean error, mean average error, mean squared error, etc. We then extracted the results from the artfit residuals layer. And these are the results for the residuals. And then we plotted a plot for the actual versus the calculated ones. Again, we assigned a unique ID to a unique series, which is actual value and a unique ID for the calculated values. Here we are just printing out some tables. Now in the TD plot, it is same as the one we used for the baseline model. Now, if we see the output of this function and when we apply a model on it, we can see that there is a significant improvement in the results. Now, we have the overlapping results for the actual versus predicted one, where the red dotted is the actual and the blue one is the predicted. Now, before jumping further, it is important to run the diagnostic statistics for testing the presence of serial autocorrelation or correlation in the estimated data. The presence of serial correlation in the residual is an indicator that the candidate model may be missing some significant AR or MA coefficients. The absence of serial correlation means the modeling flow may proceed. Now, First one we have is the Durbin-Watson test. The Durbin-Watson or DW statistics is a test for autocorrelation in the residuals from a statistical model or regression analysis. The Durbin-Watson statistics will always have a value ranging from zero and four. A value of zero indicates that there is no autocorrelation detected in the sample. Values from zero to less than two point to positive autocorrelation and values from 2 to 4 means negative autocorrelations. An independent time series table or in the residual results of an art. Now, if we talk about the function parameters of the Turbin Watson test is the series spec, which has the table name, the series ID and the row axis payloads which has the residuals and the content. Then we have the explanatory count, which is the number of explanatory variables in the original regression. Then we have the include constant, which is an indicator that the original regression equation contained a constant, also known as an intercept. 
a value of 0 indicates that there is no constant was present a value of 1 indicates that the constant was present in the method we have enumerated values specifying the web formula to calculate the Durbin Watson test statistics value DW formula means use the full summation formula to calculate the value while ACR lag 1 means perform the regression with the autocorrelation of lag 1 and use as the rule of Durbin Watson statistics then we have the significance level the significance level for the test such as 0.01 or 0.05 now if we print the result the null hypothesis is rejected it means that there is no serial autocorrelation present in our residuals then we have the td rouge godfrey function it checks for presence of serial correlation among the residuals and error terms after running a regression associated with a fitted model with respect to regression model it is expected that there is no serial correlation among the error terms whereas the Durbin Watson test is restricted to detecting first order auto regression. The Bruce Godfrey or BG test can detect autocorrelation up to any pre-designated order P. So we have the P value. Less than 0.05 means autocorrelation exists, while greater than 0.05 autocorrelation does not exist. Now we have the inputs which is the series spec containing the table name, the row axis, the target column and the content. Then we have the explanatory count, which is similar to the Durbin Watson test. Then we have the residuals max lags and the significance level. Now, if we print the output of this, we'll get the null hypothesis rejected, which means that there is no autocorrelation present in our residuals. Then we have the validation of model. These are the same steps we followed for the baseline model. We have the 30% of the data for the validation purpose. We want to print the fit matrices as we have passed one. We have to print the residual results and we have passed the value of one again. Then we have the accuracy matrices, AIC, MLR, MSC, etc. Then we have the TD extract result function for retrieving the residuals. Now, first we are extracting results from the layer odd fit residuals. Here we can find the difference between the actual and the predicted ones. And then we are using TD plot for forecasting the values actual versus predicted on the validation dataset. So here we are repeating the step. We are assigning the unique IDs for the actual value and a unique ID for the calculated value. This is for printing. Here you can see that different ID IDs are assigned to different columns. Here we are using the TD plot function, which again has the table name as the plot arima to validate fit. Then we have the row axis, row I, the series ID, ID call. Remember we have used two IDs because there were two series, one is for actual and the other one was for predicted. Then we have the fit magnitude which contains the value and the content is real. Then we have some customizations to our graph. Here we are creating a table out of the result set. And here is the result of the validation set. Now we can see a significant improvement when we use the TT smooth MA function which just to reiterate my point will make the series mean constant and here we can see that it performed very well on the validation data set now let's jump to our new section which is testing the validation residuals now typically the data scientists conduct some statistical tests against the validation residuals to verify the model is behaving in an expected manner and that the residuals can be classified as being white noise. This can be accomplished by performing TD Portman tests or by executing the TD sign if resid mean or and the TD sign if periodicities tests against the residuals. So here we have used the TD line spectrum 
to identify the periodicities that may be inherent in the input series. We can visualize this results later, but if we talk about the function parameters, we have table name, series ID, row access, payload, and content. And uh, frequency style can vary from k periodicity to k mean and whatnot. So here we can see the results from the power spectrum, which contains the spectral densities of the residuals. Now, if we plot a line graph using the TD plot function the, with the table name, row axis, series ID, and fields, we can see this kind of line spectrum on the residuals. And this can be useful to visualize that the data residuals are the error in the frequency domain. And it's a great visualization technique to see how our model is doing in terms of making errors against the actual values. On the last, we have the forecasting values section. And Teradata allow us to forecast the values using the TD Arima forecast function. It uses the ARIMA algorithm to forecast user-defined number of periods into the feature beyond this last observed sample point in the model. This function only outputs a primary result set containing the forecasted values. So the input to the ARIMA forecast function is the table name, which is the result of our ARIMA estimate function uh, if we are using the training. Or it can be TD ARIMA validate function we used the ARIMA estimate when the fit percentage is 100 and we used ARIMA validate when the TD ARIMA fit percentage is less than 100. So that's why we are using this validate. Now the function parameter contains the forecast period which is 7. It means that it can predict the 7 values in the future. The output of this function is the forecasted values which is this column. We have the row and the RD column and we have the confidence intervals. So that's all from my side. Thank you for watching part three of Tech Byte series on time series analysis using unbounded array functions of Teradata 17.20.